free trade hall is one of those uh, sex business clinic the free trade hall is one of those events that has entered <coughs> mythology. Uh, party event at Tony Wilson, twenty four hour party people and, and various accounts of it. Was that where it began for you or did you have influences pre sex business pre that gig and before it? Um, no, I didn't have any influences. There was nothing that spurred me. Uh, it was a lesser free trade hall actually when the gig was on. Uh, no, I didn't have. The only reason I saw the Sex Pistols uh, and thought I could form a band was because they, they weren't a band in the uh, accepted sense. They, they didn't make music. The, uh, I couldn't hear it anyway. It sounded so dreadful. It didn't sound like music. It didn't sound like Led Zeppelin. You had been to see the week before, actually. Which um, you I prefer the Sex Pistols. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you had more affinity for it as a, as a youngster. It was the rebellion and the hate and the anger. You know, it's like, um, to me, it was like somebody opening a door in a darkened room. In my life, uh, I saw the way when I saw the Sex Pistols. And it, it wasn't musical either, that was a weird thing. I never thought that day, oh, I think I'll go home and make unknown pleasures. <laughs> I mean, it's, it seems ridiculous now, with all the music that you've made, that, um, you know, that catalyst of seeing Johnny Rotten. Because I'd never thought about music, I'd never played a musical instrument, I'd never even considered it. Um, you know, it's, it's quite surprising. What was it like actually being a student playing cards? <laughs> Dangerous. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, it was quite an odd thing really, because his, his stage persona came about before his epilepsy. So I don't know whether people thought that you know, the epilepsy gave me stage persona, but it was definitely the other way around. Mm -hmm. The thing that Ian, I mean, he always, I remember we did one interview um, just before his death and they, they put it down as Ian Curtis as George Bush. And he went berserk. He, he was very loyal, very, very equal in the way that he treated the people in the band, which, which was fantastic. You know, he didn't want to be taken out of context. And I think that him being taken out Context, you know, because of his death in regards to the music, I think he would have hated that. One of the things that struck me when I was watching footage of, of Joy Division from the period was actually you were singing back and forth to, to, to Ian on quite a number of the tracks, and yet you barely heard you during your audio. <laughs> why was that? I mean, was that a why was that? It's because Barney didn't like us doing uh, backing vocals, he preferred the sound of his own voice. <laughs> I mean, it was funny with New Order because logically, the the New Order sound evolved from the fact that Bernard couldn't sing and play. So when he sang, he didn't play guitar. And then when he finished singing, he played guitar, and that gave us that sound. Checking the dates, I was so surprised that he would have done those nineteen eighty three because again, it predated Rave and by five years. And so, was there a sense that actually? This stuff I mean, it took Britain five years to catch up. Um, well, I suppose, I mean, I, I was too close to it, you know. I mean, I sat there for weeks with Blue Monday producing it and, and Mike Johnson, so I, I didn't, it was just another song to it. You know, so it was like, thank God that's finished. You know, that's, that's all I do with Blue Monday, on to the next one. Well, as a musician, yeah, you know, Tony and Rob Gretton always told us that the most important song was the next one. And this is why, in this day and age of where every group, we call it the Rolling Stones syndrome in music, that uh, nobody wants to hear new stuff, they just want to hear you know, your old stuff. You know, it's like, it's a terrible situation to be in, you sort of bite in the hand that feeds you. I mean, you know, I, I appreciate that uh, people want to come and they want you to play Blue London. But it sort of reminds me of when I went, when I went to see the Trox in Sweden, and they played Wild Thing three times. It's really difficult, isn't it? You know, with any work that you write, it's the comparison. I mean, every time you write a song, the next one's more difficult because you've got 300, I mean, I've written, you know, 350, 400 songs or something like that. And you have to be normal. And the next one, oh, you know, oh, it sounds like. 
like that, but it sounds like that. He's supposed to do that, isn't it? But well, it makes it more difficult to. It definitely is more difficult to write music the more music you've written. I mean, Pete Sam has a wonderful theory that uh, practiced musicians can't write good music because they know too much about it. And I can see his point because what he's saying is, is that if, when I listen to Joy Division, I listen to the bass line and the guitar, you, you, you hear things that shouldn't be together. Oh, that note should be there. Oh, shit, that's really jarring. Mm. You know, very edgy. But that's what those bands were about, and that's why they were unique. And then, like now, you know, a 50 year old Peter and a 50 year old Bernard, you, you make a record like Wait for the Sirens Call, and it doesn't sound like Joy Division. It's not as edgy, it's not got that thing. And it's because you've just learned too much. You know, it's like when you're a kid and you drive straight over around the house. And now I'm 50, I'm around them. <laughs> <laughs>